So uh, our next speaker is David Kassauer, and he will tell us about amplitudes, waveforms, and coherent states. Uh, thank you, Radu. And uh, thanks also to the organizers. In fact, I realize I don't know who the organizing committee is, but it's Svi and who else? Oh, Nikro. Nikro, raise your hand. Mikkel. <laughs> okay. So thanks to all of you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here and also to present some work uh, as well on behalf of uh, two uh, younger uh, collaborators, Andrea Cristofoli and uh, Ricardo Gonzo. You've heard another talk from Ricardo yesterday, and uh, also on behalf of a senior collaborator, uh, Donald, who will be giving uh, another talk uh, tomorrow, which I think is, uh, has some overlap, but not uh, complete. And uh, also going to remind you of a little bit of uh, earlier work with uh, Ben maybe and, uh, and with, uh, with Donald. So uh, for inspiration, we have our uh, favorite binary system of the moment, uh, Omicron and, uh, and Delta. And um, our goals, you've heard a lot from uh, previous speakers in the session, to uh, enhance the detection and also the analysis of signals from uh, current and future gravitational wave uh, observatories. So, and in particular, one of the things that uh, we need to do is to compute uh, waveforms for gravitational waves from binary in spirals. Might be uh, black holes, neutron stars, or white dwarves. I guess actually the uh, last of those is doubly politically incorrect these days. I hope there are no language commissars uh, listening out there in in Zoom land. Anyway, so these of course are all uh, bound states. I'm not going to say anything about uh, bound states uh, today, but uh, what we are going to talk about today is waveforms in unbound scattering. We'll get to that at the end. Now these, uh, in addition to being important uh, theoretical milestones to ultimate goal, are uh, and offer opportunities to compare with uh, other uh, approaches, they're possibly as well of uh, observational interest if uh, people who want to think about uh, scattering in black hole clusters or scattering events that suck energy out of uh, binary systems and accelerate decay. So we actually have opportunities to have uh, black hole mergers within the lifetime of the uh, universe. So we're working within the uh, observables based uh, formalism that uh, Ben and Donald uh, and I uh, laid out a couple of years ago. And the idea is to pick uh, well-defined observables in the quantum theory that are also relevant classically. We express them in terms of scattering amplitudes in the quantum theory. And uh, then we understand how to take the classical limit uh, efficiently. And of course, in that uh, process, we can take advantage of a lot of, of the huge uh, technology that's been developed in the recent decades for computing scattering amplitudes and uh, also the double copy. One thing that's worth uh, keeping in mind is that amplitudes are our friends, but they're not directly observable. So we have to build observable quantities out of them. And it can be a little bit confusing if you think just about amplitudes, especially in terms of uh, H bar counting and things like that. So, um, Ultimately, if we're gonna do classical physics, we need to uh, take the H bar goes to zero limit. Unlike uh, perhaps some people I'm not going to take uh, who might want, I'm not going to take the H bar goes to infinity limit. Uh, we're going to restore uh, H bar via dimensional analysis and we can do it in such a way that we keep kind of the conventional normalization of uh, the uh, plane wave states and also of scattering amplitudes. We then have to set up our initial state and uh, we then have to uh, look at all the sources of H bar. They come from couplings or they come from messenger wave numbers. And I'm going to use the bar notation uh, to denote uh, messenger wave numbers. Messengers here are the uh, particles that uh, carry long range forces let's say photons for QED and uh, gravitons for gravity. And then we turn the crank. We may have to do Laurent expansions in H bar. Uh, once we certainly once we go beyond um, leading order 
And uh, in physical observables, we of course expect and so far uh, find that singular terms in H bar will cancel. There should be some general argument, which um, Donald, I think, will take some uh, steps towards uh, why that should happen. And then we have to integrate over phase space. And in, in the case of some of the waveform observables, do some other uh, expansions, which I'll, uh, I'll mention later. And this is kind of a, a mechanical procedure uh, once you set up the uh, correct uh, correct expressions. So just again, as a reminder, if we only consider the H bars from the coupling, then in fact, we would find uh, a very singular behavior as we go up in, uh, in loop order. Uh, but that, of course, I'm, might get confused, but that, of course, is not the whole story. So the observables we've, uh, we've looked at uh, to date are things like uh, the impulse, uh, the change in momentum of a scattered uh, particle. And from that, you can, of course, extract the scattering angle, uh, the total radiated momentum. And today, I'm going to show you uh, the waveform uh, towards the end of, uh, end of the talk. So we're working in fully relativistically, keeping C equals one. So it's just an ordinary perturbative expansion. Uh, here in, in gravity, it would be in, in Newton's constant, in, in QED, in, in E. And uh, from this viewpoint, it's very natural to do both the conservative and dissipative uh, terms uh, together rather than uh, chopping them up into, into different pieces. So um, we scatter two things. And uh, if they're both massive, then we're going to be looking at, at point particles. And this, of course, is, is essentially a review. We build wave packets. We want uh, low point particles with localized positions and momenta. Here, we're not going to actually look inside them, although that will be something uh, interesting to do in the future. So we start with plane wave states, but we build wave functions on top of them. And uh, I don't know if I can usefully use a pointer here because people out on Zoom can't see. Uh, maybe I can move my, uh, is my mouse visible there? No, no. Okay, let's, well. Um, so we have an integral over uh, on-shell phase space. There are two wave functions for the incoming particles. There's a phase factor which encodes the impact parameter. And then it's, this is a superposition for plane wave states. And we can uh, abbreviate it and uh, tidy up the two pies by hiding them inside uh, all sorts of hats. And a very simple example of a wave function is just a, uh, an exponential. Um, and in spite of what you might think, uh, this thing is actually bounded everywhere for massive particles. And uh, the C, little C, encodes the uh, H bar inside it. It's a ratio essentially of Compton to uh, wavelengths of to a packet uh, size of the uh, massive particle. So in fact, um, we have uh, generically three scales in the problem. There's the Compton wavelength of the problem. There's the size of the wave function for the wave packet that we've built. And finally, there's the impact parameter. And uh, you need to have the particles localized. So that gives you one um, separation. And then you need to have the wave packets very well separated. So we're not looking inside the quantum mechanical behavior of each of these wave packets. That gives you another uh, large inequality. And a more careful analysis confirms uh, what we like to call this uh, Goldilocks condition, this hierarchy of, uh, of scales that you need to uh, impose. So the first question, and in a sense, I'm going to do the uh, elements of the title in reverse uh, order, um, is what happens if we want to do uh, massless scattering? So if we want to scatter photons or, or gravitons, well, the Compton wavelength is infinite, so we can't localize them. We can't just build a wave packet as we did for massive particles. On the other hand, plane waves are still not, uh, not appropriate. We're not doing collider scattering here. And uh, it turns out that the solution is to use uh, coherent states. So in a sense, if we're ultimately going to be 
uh, scattering classical waves off of each other or classical waves off of uh, point particles, then from a quantum mechanical point of view, uh, we should be uh, looking at uh, coherent states. So some people I'm sure already know these things because they've read our paper, which came out quite a while ago, uh, or they've read other literature, but some people may not. So let me just take a couple minutes um, to remind you. So these are basically uh, ex exponentials of a uh, creation operator, and uh, they create states of indefinite uh, particle number, which we'll denote by uh, an alpha. The alpha here corresponds to the coefficient inside the exponential, which we call the wave shape function. It in general could be a complex uh, function of momenta, although it's often convenient to take it uh, to be real. And the choice of wave shape function is uh, a freedom that you have even in the uh, classical limit, as it turns out, to incorporate different kinds of classical waves. You might have uh, narrow beams, you might have a, a point source of radiation that is uh, emitting uh, in all directions. There are a lot of things you could have uh, in terms of classical radiation. So these states are uh, eigenstates of the uh, creation operator. Basically, when you act on them, uh, you get one of these wave shapes, and uh, that turns out to be a simple way to actually do some of the uh, evaluations, which is why I mention it here. Okay, so what is the uh, connection to the classical field? So I'm going to do the explicit examples I'm going to do are going to be from uh, QED, but uh, by uh, double copying a lot of these, a lot of these equations, you can equally well do it for the uh, gravitational field. So we have uh, an expression given in terms of uh, creation and annihilation operators and uh, with coefficients that are uh, polarization vectors for the electromagnetic field uh, operator. And uh, let's see what happens if we compute its expectation value in this state created uh, the coherent uh, state created by our uh, coherent state operator. So again, because of the uh, properties of uh, the state, it basically trades the creation and annihilation operators for the wave shapes and its uh, complex uh, conjugate. And um, we can uh, do a little bit of, uh, of manipulation of, of the H bars, rewriting things in terms of, of wave numbers, and uh, also in terms of this uh, alpha bar, which is related to the original wave shape in a way I'll tell you in a minute. But now there, we have a formula that has no uh, H bars at all. And in fact, you recognize it as just the uh, mode expansion of the classical field. So the, uh, the alpha bar here, these things are now just the Fourier coefficients of uh, a general uh, solution to the uh, classical field equations. And that happens so long as we set this uh, alpha bar to be have a certain scaling of uh, certain powers of H bar extracted from our wave shape function. So that's where the transition from the quantum coherent state to the uh, classical uh, wave is, uh, is happening. Now, we can compute the uh, number of photons here. And uh, that's something which has to be large when we go to the classical limit uh, in order to uh, get a factorization of uh, correlation functions. And that will be the case so long as, as alpha bar in a sense is generic, that it doesn't, it doesn't become parametrically small as h bar goes to zero. And then you'll have some, some uh, quantity which is multiplied by one over h bar. You take h bar to zero, the number of photons or the number of gravitons will uh, will become uh, large, and that's what corresponds to a uh, classical wave. And again, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this uh, function, actually the, the classical function a alpha bar, can be chosen to give you the correct uh, form of classical wave or to make uh, further approximations such as uh, geometrical optics. So let's um, 
let's look at uh, one example, uh, which is that of uh, kind of, in fact, the uh, first classic uh, calculation in, uh, in general relativity, uh, that of, of light uh, deflection. So we're going to look at massive massless scattering now, or if you like it in the classical language, a point particle uh, with classical wave scattering, classical wave scattering off of a point particle. And uh, we're going to build an initial state in the same way that we did uh, for the uh, two incoming point particles, except that, so we have a, a wave function and an integral over on-shell phase space for the uh, point particle. And then we have a coherent state alpha two for the classical wave. And again, there's going to be some, uh, some impact parameter. And we can compute the impulse uh, just as we did in the uh, point particle point particle case. There are two terms. Um, again, one of them is linear in T, the other is quadratic in T. So the virtual term and the cut term. And uh, at lowest order, we again, just need the, the first term. So we simply write that out, and it's a little bit uh, simpler in some ways than the corresponding uh, point particle point particle because there's fewer uh, wave function factors, but it's basically the same, uh, the same expression. So the one thing that um, we have to think about is how to evaluate matrix elements uh, between coherent states. That's not something we typically uh, do in, uh, in, in field theory because we're used to doing uh, plane wave states. So let's just take a couple minutes to, uh, to think about that. So these are not um, state, these are not of definite order in, in, uh, in perturbation theory. And the way you might do that is you introduce complete sets of states of definite particle number and you sum over them on each side of the T matrix. And then you'd evaluate the uh, T matrix between these states of, of, uh, of definite particle number. And then you do the uh, matrix elements of the definite state with the coherent state. And the thing that's uh, a little bit subtle here, um, well, it's, you have to realize that the subtlety exists and you could take care of it. There are a lot of disconnected pieces because a lot of these messengers are just going from the initial, from the, you know, the, the bra to the, uh, the ket, or maybe it's really from the ket to the bra. Um, and you have to sum over all those disconnected uh, pieces. And it's, you can do it, but it's, uh, it's a lot messier. And instead it's uh, convenient to introduce a representation, which as far as I know is due to uh, the late and very great uh, Steven Weinberg of the T matrix in terms of, of uh, creation and uh, annihilation operators. So we write this, uh, it's now a sum over you know, all the different uh, helicity states and there's integrals over uh, on-shell phase space. And um, it's now a, uh, a, a matrix element between states of, of definite particle number times the appropriate creation and annihilation operator. And of course, I've just written out the lowest order term, the dot, dot, dot terms include all the uh, higher, um, higher terms with more creation and uh, annihilation operators. And the advantage of this is if you now plug this into the uh, required matrix element, you essentially build up the, uh, all at once, you, you get the required factors of, of alpha two and alpha two star, instead of having to build them up from uh, complicated uh, sums. And um, the, uh, the matrix element of, uh, of T in a, in a state of definite uh, messenger number, well, that of course is something we know, it's just the, uh, the amplitude. You have to be uh, a little bit careful about uh, crossing here. Um, because the usual convention in, in uh, amplitudes land is to have everything outgoing. So you have to just keep track of where the helicities are going. But once you do that, everything is fine. So for the light deflection, what we want here is the gravitational scattering 
of a photon off of a neutral uh, massive scalar. Um, and that's a straightforward uh, calculation to do. And uh, again, within the classical uh, regime, you can choose to do this in geometric optics, and that implies certain additional uh, inequalities between the uh, wavelength uh, lambda, between the perpendicular size of the beam, and between the uh, impact parameter. And uh, when you turn the crank, then to I'm sure no one's great surprise, you recover the a very well-known value, which dates back uh, now, I guess, uh, whatever it is, uh, 106 years or something. So that's, uh, that's how things work for uh, classical wave uh, scattering off of, uh, of particles. The thing that we're actually maybe more interested in uh, observationally is, um, looking at uh, classical waves that are coming out and uh, measuring those. So the observables that uh, we talked about in the, in the paper with Ben and, and also that I've, I've talked about today, thus far, it's, it's an essential, a global observable. You'd have to cover the four pi, um, the four pi sphere at infinity with detectors everywhere and, and have them all communicate to do the experiment, which would be Difficult in electromagnetism and impossible actually in gravity. But you um, have nine minutes, including the questions. Yeah, that's good. I'm I'm on track. Maybe even finish early. Um, so what we want to do is to uh, think about uh, point-like observables. So we have uh, again, you know, for the moment we're looking at unbound scattering. So we have a scattering region. And there's going to be some interaction there that uh, effectively generates some radiation. And that radiation is then going to propagate in the direction of, uh, of our observer. And if it were electromagnetic and in the right frequency band, uh, the observer could actually do it with a Mark I eyeball. But if you're looking for gravity, of course, you have very sophisticated uh, interference, uh, laser interference apparatuses. And uh, we can write down in terms of, of a, uh, a current, if you like, that is uh, generated in this uh, scattering region. And uh, the number of indices here is, is essentially double the number that are carried by the appropriate field. So it would be two for electromagnetism and four for uh, gravity. We can write down a, a radiation uh, observable and um, we, we want to then take the large distance behavior. We don't really care about the stuff that dies off as higher powers of the, uh, the distance x. And the coefficient of that leading term is the, uh, the waveform, which here I've written in, uh, in the time domain. Of course, you could do spectral functions and look at it in the frequency domain as well. And uh, both of those are, are useful uh, points of view. So to actually uh, measure um, that waveform, what we're going to look for, uh, in this case, we're going back to uh, point particle, point particle scattering. We're going to measure in the QED case, the field strength. We're gonna measure the electromagnetic field um, ultimately at, uh, at infinity. So of course we want to measure that in the outgoing state. We do the usual rewriting of the out going state um, in terms of the incoming state. If we had injected radiation, if we were kind of shining a light or, or maybe poking our black hole with some gravitational waves, then we would also have terms corresponding to the um, to radiation in the initial state. But here we're starting with the initial state that has no radiation. So it's just S dagger F uh, S. And uh, we can then write down are a general form of, of our current. It's given in terms of, of uh, uh, matrix elements of uh, essentially just working out what F, the expression for F is. So there's an anti-symmetrization of K bar and, and the uh, polarization vector. And it, it turns out to be uh, convenient in kind of an amplitudes uh, spinorial language to also work 
with uh, Newman uh, Penrose scalars. And uh, then you'll be looking at uh, states of definite helicity. So you have uh, a annihilation operator with a minus or creation operator with a plus. And um, if in the, uh, and it'll be a Fourier transform to get it back into the time, uh, the time domain. I'll show you the, uh, an expression in the Fourier domain uh, directly in a couple of uh, slides. So again, we expand the S matrix. Uh, there's no radiation in the initial state. So we get uh, two terms, which are, you can rewrite to look a little bit more like the uh, impulse terms in terms of uh, commutators, if you wish, but this is uh, perhaps a more natural form. So you have the quote virtual term and the quote cut term, again, linear and quadratic uh, in the T matrix. Again, the, uh, it's uh, order G cubed for the first one, order g to the fifth uh, and higher uh, for the second term. So at leading order, only the first term is, is going to contribute. And just as in the case of the impulse, of course, the, the first uh, formula here uh, for the, um, the electromagnetic tensor is true to all orders. And so you just expand it order by order uh, in perturbation theory. And so we can write out Again, using the very first initial state that I showed you, we simply write it out and we now get a, um, here there's no coherent state, so we don't need this trick of rewriting the T matrix, we simply evaluate it. And um, you have a, 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 an annihilation operator, so you get a, uh, a photon uh, or graviton in the, uh, in the bra, and uh, the basic object we have is now a five-point uh, amplitude. And uh, you can then uh, turn the crank, and uh, we have this, uh, the classical limit, all the elements that go into it denoted by these double uh, angle brackets. And inside of it, you find the same radiation kernel that we originally had found um, for the um, for the total uh, radiated momentum, it's, it's really the same object, except here it's more differential. Um, essentially, the electromagnetic field um, just has, uh, has a directional uh, integral in it. And if you write the uh, Newman-Penrose scalar in, uh, in the momentum space, uh, or frequency space instead of in the time domain, then you see that it literally is with uh, some uh, decoration. It literally just is this uh, radiation uh, kernel. So at leading order, what are the things that actually uh, show up in the uh, radiation kernel? So in the frequency domain, we get um, uh, Bessel functions. I think these are whatever modified Bessel functions of the second kind. Um, uh, and uh, if you then uh, uh, convert them to time domain functions, uh, then I guess you learn, first of all, that unlike the uh, WHO, we're not scared of the 14th letter of the uh, Greek uh, alphabet, but you get various uh, rational functions and, uh, and uh, trigonometric or inverse hyperbolic trigonometric functions. And just as um, just as in the ordinary loop uh, amplitudes, you're going to get some tower of interesting functions, which, as we've, uh, as we can guess from some of the earlier results we've seen today, will include uh, poly logarithms, and perhaps they will include um, other interesting functions uh, as well as you go to uh, loop order. So I think I'm uh, I'm actually within uh, my time. Let me. Uh, flash my uh, summary slide. So I've, I've uh, kind of reviewed a little bit the observables-based formalism for uh, classical physics by scattering amplitudes. And uh, I've shown you how to incorporate classical waves via coherent states, and uh, also showed you um, how to directly uh, compute the waveform for radiation and the basic the message uh, if I'm to uh, summarize it to one line, is that the waveform basically is the five point amplitude. So thank you. Thank you very much, David, for a very nice and clear talk. Are there any questions for David? Yes. Uh, can you say something about 
the use of coherent states for massive spinning particles? For massive or massless? Massive spinning particles. Um, I, uh, it's an interesting question, but I haven't really thought about it. So I have, I have nothing particularly to, to say. What, what are you driving at? I mean, you're, you're looking- There was a paper like, by incoherent states for massive spinning particles. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any comments to, to make. Gabriela? Yeah, um, um, I wonder how can you get a classical wave in the final state by having just uh, a five point function? Isn't somewhere also there hidden the fact that, uh, that the final state has many, many? <clears throat> so the, the expectation <laughs> is that the, uh, the final state will also be uh, the outgoing radiation will also be a coherent state and that you'll be building that up um, as you go to higher orders in uh, in perturbation theory but the the overlap uh, that you're seeing here um, in some sense is is what is happening at, at uh, lowest order but i think the picture that you're going to see at uh, at higher orders is that it's a, a five point amplitude where the uh, radiation a component is is a, it's a five point amplitude into a coherent state rather than a five point amplitude into a single uh, messenger state. Yeah, that's that's what I would expect, but I didn't see it uh, as well, a. Oh, you're seeing the lowest order uh, version of that. Assumption in your derivation. Well, there's no. I mean, this is something that would come out of the uh, calculation. It's not something you put in as an assumption. Okay. But we are a little bit over time, so uh, uh, let's direct further questions to David, to the Slack channel, or to private discussions if the questions are at UCLA. So let's thank him again. Um,